Welcome to the series of short lectures covering statistics for proteomics. Today's lecture will briefly overview dimensionality reduction. And specifically, we are going to discuss major principles and approaches using used for dimensionality reduction that will be illustrated with some intuitive examples uh, as and demonstrate and as well we are going to discuss uh, some of the potential problems of dimensionality reduction and how results can be evaluated. Uh, two subsequent lectures are going to go into a more detailed description of methods for dimensionality reduction, both linear and nonlinear methods. So to begin with, with a very intuitive example, consider the map of the Earth. Our planet is a sphere, which is a three-dimensional object, but oftentimes it is more convenient for us to represent it as a two-dimensional projection. And there is a challenge in doing that because the sphere is, a fundament is fundamentally a three-dimensional object. So when we project it into two dimensions, there are distortions that occur. And to minimize those distortions, people have developed a variety of different approaches to those projections. And each of those approaches is going to have different trade-offs in terms of the uh, fidelity or the accuracy of the projection and the distortions that uh, that have occurred. So this example already begins to tell you that even going from three to two dimensions, uh, there is there may be loss of information or corruption of the information. So you can oftentimes this is true. Uh, dimensionality reduction uh, results just as an approximation of the high dimensional object. As another intuitive example uh, of performing dimensionality reduction, you can consider projecting a cylinder into two projections. And from this image here, you can see that uh, this uh, such a projection uh, might result in very different result depending on the angle on the projection. The cylinder might appear either as a square or as a circle, depending on the vantage point on the, on the angle again. And, and that's something that can happen when one is doing high dimensional projections, uh, when one is projecting high dimensional data into low dimensional spaces and something to always keep in mind that we shouldn't make our conclusions just based on the low dimensional data as I'll have a little bit more to say towards the end, about this towards the end of, of the lecture. So why are we doing dimensionality reduction generally? One very common uh, motivation for dimensionality reduction is to provide intuitive data display. The previous two examples were from three-dimensional space where dimensionality reduction is convenient but not necessarily essential. But when we deal with data sets that are 1,000 or 10,000 dimensional or higher, it becomes very challenging to visualize them and therefore being able to reduce their dimensionality in a meaningful way is attractive as a means towards visualizing them. As we do that, we have to be aware that there are distortions that might occur as indeed was the case of projecting a sphere into a plane, a 2D plane. Uh, and one thing that you should be aware of is the different methods uh, offer trade-offs in terms of pres preserving uh, low distances in high dimensional space while uh, introducing um, distortions at global distances or other methods are good at capturing the global distances, but they distort local distances. So these distortions that are oftentimes introduced in the course of dimensionality reduction are going to depend on the type of method that is used. Another very common motivation for dimensionality reduction is to identify structure in the data. For example, if we have clustering subset of our observations are similar in the high dimensional space, and that similarity can be detected in the form of a cluster in the low dimensional space. Uh, similarly, uh, we can go a step further and ask, uh, 
what are some of the factors that are driving uh, this variability in the data, for example, the structure or the clustering, and these factors may not be known a priori, so there are latent factors inferred from the data that then uh, factor analysis can try to attribute to, uh, to various uh, physical factors underlying the observed variance in the data. How do you perform dimensionality reduction? There are very, very many methods that can be categorized based on different criteria and principles. Uh, here I've chosen to break them down into linear and nonlinear methods, which is not the only way of categorizing them, but I will use that as a way of introducing some of the commonly used methods. Among the linear methods, principal component analysis, oftentimes abbreviated as PCA, is computationally very efficient and very simple. It allows to represent a significant fraction of the variance in the data in the form of linear combinations between the variables. Each linear combination among variables in the data captures orthogonal uh, part of, of, the, of the variation in the high dimensional space, and that allows to represent uh, as much as possible variation in two dimensions or three dimensions and, and so on. Uh, a more generalized version of the principal component analysis is a common principal component analysis or CPCA, which allows to project data for multiple related data sets simultaneously. Uh, another variation of principal component analysis is sparse principal component analysis, which uh, allows to use only a subset of the variables in the original data set to capture, to, to find these principal components that capture a substantial fraction of the variance in the data. And this has the advantage that th such simpler combinations of fewer variables may be more interpretable. Another related but clearly distinct method is independent component analysis and so on and so, and so forth. There are many methods for uh, dimensionality reduction. Uh, a particular class of methods uh, aims to attribute the variance in the data to latent factors, and these methods uh, fall under the umbrella of factor analysis. The nonlinear methods are similarly diverse and numerous, and some of these methods are merely for visualizing the data. They do not infer latent factors or components. They just arrange the data points into a lower dimensional space, while other methods infer the underlying uh, components of, of the data as well. Uh, these methods include TSNI and UMAP that recently have become very popular for, single, for visualizing single cell RNA sequencing data. Principal curves is a method that generalizes principal component analysis to nonlinear manifolds. Isomap is another method introduced about two decades ago that I'll, I'll briefly uh, show you an example with in a couple of slides. Another method is locally linear embedding. So even if we cannot, if we have locally linear pieces, they globally we can represent a nonlinear manifold, which, which can be quite powerful and useful, of course, if we have dense enough data points to support such uh, locally linear embedding. So let me give you a couple of intuitive examples to illustrate uh, dimensionality reduction. And the first example is a linear dimensionality uh, reduction of uh, uh, plotting uh, protein abundances measured in two different cell types, uh, HeLa or U937 monocyte cells either in single cells, which here are represented with squares, or in bulk samples composed of many cells represented with circles. So when we reduce the uh, protein measurements, which live in thousand dimensional space, to just two dimensions, we see that there are two clear clusters uh, that appear and separated by the first principal component, uh, which coincide perfectly with the cell types. 
Uh, so when, when you look at the principal component like this, one of the things to always be uh, interested in is what fraction of the variance is captured by the first and the second and the third principal component, what fraction of the total variance in the data you're looking at. And in this case, uh, about three quarters of the variance is captured by the first principal component analysis, which shows that we are looking at a significant fraction of of the variance in the high dimensional data set. Another thing uh, to be uh, asking is what is driving the observed pattern, in this case, separation between cell types. It could be that um, one of the cell types uh, wasn't, was, had different size, HeLa cells are larger than monocytes, and that is driving the variance on the first principal component. So it's useful to have controls such as the bulk samples to know that uh, the separation that you see in one type of samples is consistent with the same separation in different type of samples and, and so on. So generally, this, this example also demonstrates the ability to uh, perform dimensionality reduction of uh, many different types of measurements simultaneously, which enhances the uh, interpretation of the low dimensional projection. So here is a nonlinear example where we have this two-dimensional curved manifold that is embedded in, in a three-dimensional space. It's, um, uh, so you can see here the, the data points that are uh, shaping this uh, curved 2D manifold. And in, in such cases, the Euclidean distances between points, for example, between this point here and this point here, uh, may not be representative of the geodesic distance across the manifold, because if you're moving just on the manifold to get from this point to this, you have to travel all these distance here shown with a solid blue curve, which is much longer than the Euclidean distance. And nonlinear dimensionality reduction methods, such as isomap shown here, allow to to tackle this challenge and to perform correct and correct dimensionality reduction in, in this context. These methods are really quite powerful uh, when the data point densities are high enough to support um, the inference uh, that these methods perform. So very quickly, uh, towards the end of this introductory lecture, I want to mention something that is quite important when one does dimensionality reduction, which is to, uh, to not make interpretations and conclusions only based on the low dimensional projection. We already saw in the as we project the three-dimensional object, a globe into two dimensions, so there might be distortions. As we project a 10,000 dimensional object to two dimensions, the distortions can be much larger. So what appears to be the case from the low dimensional projection may not hold in the high dimensional projection. So it's always useful to, to validate it. In this case, what, what, what is shown in this uh, low dimensional projection is a joint projection of protein levels in single macrocyte, macrophages and monocytes measured by mass spectrometry and RNA levels in the same cells, macrophages and monocytes measured by RNA sequencing. So we can see that uh, there are two clusters being formed, one corresponding to the macrophages, the other corresponding to the monocytes of, of both types of measurements, and the RNA data appears to be more diffused, more spread out clusters, so one might say that there is more variability based on looking at this picture, but this interpretation is, uh, is uh, precarious because the larger spread might simply be due to having more single cells analyzed by RNA sequencing, or might be due to a distortion from the dimensionality reduction um, or some other factor. Uh, so it's, uh, it, 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 this dimensionality reduction is useful for generating a hypothesis, but this hypothesis needs to be further evalu evaluated, i.e. are indeed RNA measurements in single cells more variable in this case, and the protein measurements has to be further evaluated in the high dimensional data set. And here's one example of doing such uh, validation. Uh, which can be done simply by computing pairwise similarity uh, between 
cells in the high dimensional data and plotting those pairwise similarities as distributions. So when we performed this analysis in this case, we found that indeed the uh, observations from the low dimensional space, the conus joint projection held in the higher dimensional data set. But this doesn't necessarily need to be the case always. So uh, it's important that when we observe certain um, trends, when we formulate hypotheses based on the low dimensional projection, we go and test those in the high dimensional space as well. So with this, I would conclude this short introductory lecture, and I would invite you to join the, the two SQL lectures that are going to discuss in more details the linear and the nonlinear methods for dimensionality reduction. And the next lecture in this SQL is going to be on linear methods for dimensionality reduction.